everybody. Welcome. So good to be here this morning. It's been a while since I've been up here uh, in this role capacity. I'm Stephanie, if we haven't met, and I am the Director of Adult Discipleship here at Christ Center. And this morning, we are in a series called Relationship Hacks. And if you have been with us throughout this series, you may have actually looked up the word by now, hacks. It's kind of a funny word. And when I looked it up, it has a lot of meanings. So I want to share with you this morning the meaning that I am kind of launching off as we go into this this morning. A strategy or technique for managing one's time or activities more efficiently. And we have been talking a lot about relationships because we want to have healthy, good relationships. I don't don't think any of us wake up in the morning and go, oh man, I just hope my relationships are terrible today. You know, we don't do that. We want good relationships. And so over the past few weeks, we've talked about relationship with our friends, relationship with our enemies, relationships with those outside of the church, relationships with our families. And today we're actually talking about relationships with each other, with Christ Center and with the body of Christ at large. So we're talking about the people over here and their relationships with the people over here. The people on the board at Christ Center having relationship with the attenders at Christ Center. Staff, how we have relationships with our volunteers. Kind of all encompassing. Um, Many of you know, most of you probably know by now, that when we moved into this building, we also moved into a new people management system. And this system is called, we call it CCB, Church Community Builder. And it has been a challenge. And this is the system which we organize volunteers, finances, um, small group leaders, all the different things kind of go, children's ministry, students' ministry, all go through the system. And so your staff have been working really hard to learn the system. And one day... uh, I was sitting at a desk with Amber, and she's our director of visual communications here at Christ Center. And I was looking and looking and looking in CCB for something, and finally she kind of looks at me and she goes, oh, hit control F. So I hit control F, and this nice little box pops up, and she's like, type in what you're looking for. So I type it in, and there it is on the screen highlighted, so easy, right? And in a sense, that was a hack. It was a strategy that helped me do what I was doing more effectively, more efficiently. A little while later, Pastor Andy, who had been sitting there observing this whole thing, says to me, well, Steph, you know what Control-F stands for, right? No. (laughs) Some of you who know computers are like, really? You did not know that? I did not. So F stands for find, Control-Find. I guess it's a pretty universal thing with computers. And so what happened in that moment is now not only did I know how to do something more efficiently, better, I also now had some understanding and some meaning as to why. 26 letters in the alphabet, F stands for find. So now when I go to look for something, I can remember that. It's helpful. So this morning, what I want to do is in that little box, control F, I want to find unity. How do we, as a church family, how do we stay unified? How do we get unified? How do we... Um, In a world so divided, how do we keep that unity? And um, I want to do this by just going straight to Jesus. We gather around Jesus. We are a church around Jesus. All of our meetings, all of our serving, everything we do is because of Jesus. And in John, the book of John, um, 17, 20 through 23, Actually, the whole of John 17 is a prayer that Jesus prays. But in these three verses, Jesus actually prays something really important to the idea of unity. And so I want to read this part of the prayer that Jesus prayed. Jesus said, I am praying not only for these disciples. So he had his 12 guys, right? He had his inner circle, his team, his squad. They had been doing life together for two and a half years eating together, working together, doing everything together, so they were tight. And Jesus says, I am praying not only for these guys, but also for all who will ever believe in me through their message. So if you believe in Jesus this morning, 
In this moment when Jesus was on earth, he was praying for you, and he was praying for me. Jesus says, I pray that they will all, important word, I pray that they will all be one, just as you, Father God, and I are one, as you are in me, Father God, and I am in you, and may they be in us, so that the world will believe you sent me. Verse 22. I have given them the glory you gave me, so they may be one as we are one. I am in them, you are in me. And then listen to this. This is the part I really want us to catch this morning. May they experience such perfect unity that the world... So now he's not talking about us, and he's not talking about his disciples in that moment. He's saying... May they experience such perfect unity that the world will know that you sent me, God, to earth and that you love them as much as you love me. That the world will know, God, that Father God, that you love the world as much as you love Jesus. And it is here in this prayer that we find a responsibility, a weight, a significance. I don't know, so if you guys know me, you know that any personality test I have ever taken, the top thing hates conflict. Doesn't matter. They just put it right there. This girl hates conflict every single time I take a test. But this isn't about me. This isn't about, oh, I don't want conflict with you because I don't feel good. This is way bigger than that. This is Jesus connecting um, our unity with the world knowing that he loves the world. And that is way bigger than us. It is, it is a responsibility, a weight, um, important. Unity is mission critical. There's a quote that says, we are often the only Bible that people read. Now, I don't know how theologically true we could probably have an argument about that, but we won't because we're talking about unity today. Um, but I have, a, I have a story about this. So when I was probably, I think I had probably maybe, I was a little bit into year 20 of my life. And I had gone through a really hard breakup, and I had actually come home to Kashmir, and I was sitting in the bleachers at some, I think it might have been a baseball, Kashmir baseball, high school baseball game. And I'm sitting in the bleachers, and I'm surrounded by these moms who are all Christians, they're all Christ followers. And as I was sitting there, I remember thinking, they're all from different churches. And it was just kind of an interesting thought I had in that moment. Like, oh, she goes there, she goes there, she goes there. Well, they all knew I was going through a breakup because we live in a small town. And so they were kind of, you know, just encouraging me and just talking to me and just kind of loving on me. And one of these moms invited me to a Bible study she was having at her house that evening. I did not know she had an ulterior motive. So I talked my roommate into going, and, and we show up, and I quickly realized, oh my gosh, she invited us to youth group. Now... I mean, two years, three years isn't that big deal, but it kind of is when you're high school or college, early college, there's kind of a weird thing there. So all of a sudden, I'm walking into youth group with my roommate, but we go in. Well, she introduces me to her nephew. I think she was trying to set me up, but no sparks flew. So we go in, and then she takes me into the living room, and we walk into the living room, and there's all these high school kids, and they're sitting in a circle. And I kind of sit down, and I'm kind of taking it in, and then I see Steve Haney, and he's telling a story, and he's telling a story where he's weaving God's love into this amazing story, and I'm telling you in that moment, sparks flew. But the reason I'm telling you this story is because six months later, we got married, and we did not have two pennies to rub together. We had no money, and those six women and their churches all came around us. One of the churches hosted the bridal shower. One of the ho churches hosted the rehearsal dinner. Another one, the wedding. Um, another one provided the marriage counseling for us. They unified 
it wasn't about, you know, each of the different churches have their different theologies and their different doctrines about things. But in that moment, that's not what they were about. They were about pouring out the love of God on Steve and I and being generous with his love. And in that moment, their unity helped me to know God's love. And I came to know his love long before I really understood the Bible because of their unity. Jesus not only prays for us to be unified, but he does something else. In John 13, he, we read this story about Jesus, and um, I just want to set it up a little bit. So have you ever gone to a family supper, and you're like, you're, you're in the car, you're headed there, or, you know, you're walking over to the house where the dinner is, and you just kind of have this, like, anxiety in your gut a little bit because you know that underneath the niceties, there's brewing things. There's things kind of going on between the different siblings or between mom and dad or between Aunt Susie and Uncle Fred, whatever. You know there's some stuff, right? And we, and we, we still go to those family meals. Well, in a sense, in John 13, there's a family meal happening. It's happening with Jesus and his 12 guys. And when I think about, especially as a person of no conflict, I hate conflict, um, as I think about sitting at this meal, I just cannot imagine Jesus in this moment. I just, it really, when you read the story, it just kind of wrecks you a little bit. Because Jesus is sitting there, and he knows that sitting over here somewhere is Judas. And Jesus knows full well that Judas is going to betray him, that Ju Judas is going to be the reason that these men come and find Jesus and arrest him and crucify him. Jesus knows, and Judas knows, and they're sitting there having a meal together. Then there's Peter, who I cannot imagine that Jesus isn't a little frustrated with Peter by this point. Peter is kind of always putting his foot in his mouth. He's kind of always overconfident, um, making promises he can't keep. He's already made a promise he's not going to keep. And Jesus knows that. Jesus knows that this man that he has loved and invested in and walked with and, and mentored, that this man is going to deny Jesus not once but three times in Jesus' most urgent moment of darkness and need. Jesus also knows that there's guys around the table arguing about who is going to be greatest in the kingdom when he's been trying for two and a half years to teach them that's not what the kingdom of God is about. And he's sitting here eating with these guys. Now, I, I can't tell you what Jesus was thinking in that moment. I can tell you what I would be thinking, right? I would be frustrated. I would be self-preserving, self-protecting. I'd be trying to control the situation with Judas. I'd be telling Peter, like, get off the team. What is wrong with you? You know, like, I would be having all these self-righteous, self-protective moments. And you know what Jesus does? He gets down to their stinky, dirty feet. And one by one, he washes them. He doesn't self-protect. He doesn't self-preserve. He doesn't fight for his right or his way. He washes feet. It's amazing. A few verses later, Jesus says this to his guys after he's washed their feet. He says, a new command I give you, that you love one another. And then he says this, as I have loved you. Well, how did he love them? He loved them when they were being ugly, when they weren't being perfect, when they, were, they had flaws and they had yucky stuff inside of them. And he loved them. He washed their feet. He met division, the potential for division, with feet washing. And if you've ever had your feet washed, you know that in that moment, like when you get pedicures, um, you know, they kind of massage your feet and they kind of put it in the warm water. And what does it do? It brings this calming sense. So where Jesus could have lit the fire and created all of this crazy, instead he just brought a spirit of calm. So Jesus says, a new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you. So you must 
love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. It is a command, and it's not about us. It is so that the world will know that God loves the world. That's hard to think about. Like all that crazy going on out there, all the evil, all the wickedness, all the sin. And God says, I want the world to know I love it as much as I love my son. I love the world. So now Jesus gives us this command, a command that we love one another. A couple of weeks ago, one of our small group leaders came into the office, and she had a list and on the, on the top of this list, it said, the one another's, the one another's of the New Testament. And I thought about that with this verse where it says, um, love as I have loved you, so you must love one another. So actually in your chair fronts, there's pieces of paper with the whole list. Just something for you to take home and reflect on this week. All the ways that we can love one another in action. So that's kind of your homework uh, for this week. Take that home, study it, look at it. Okay, so we know that unity amongst us, unity between us and other churches, is mission critical. The whole body of Christ, we're called, commanded to be united and to serve one another. So I have some final thoughts as we um, think about that. And the first one is that we must anticipate the continual divide and conquer technique of the enemy. From the beginning of time, the serpent has been trying and working at and just persisting in trying to separate humanity from God and then trying to separate us from each other. In the book of Genesis, in the beginning, God creates Adam, he creates Eve, everything is great, everything is good, and then all of a sudden we read about the serpent. And we read that the serpent gets in the face of Eve and says, Did God really say? Does it really matter? Does God really care? Does God really require our obedience? And right there and then, the enemy starts to create this division between us and God. And it gets worse. God comes and he says, Adam... What is going on? Adam says, she made me do it. It was her. Right? Now, not only is there division between us and God, now there's division between us and each other and us and God. Adam didn't take responsibility for his stuff. So easy to reflect. She said that about me. He did that to me. He did that and it ruined all this. That person said they'd show up and they didn't show up and they left me with all this stuff. This person is doing this and picking this side and I can't understand it and it's crazy. How easy for us to say they made me do it instead of taking responsibility, looking at the log in our eye instead of the speck in theirs. So that happens. More of this division that we have to watch for, we have to anticipate. And then you get the story of Cain and Abel. Cain and Abel are the sons of Adam and Eve. They're brothers. They both take an offering to God, and it says that God is pleased with Abel's offering. God is not pleased with Cain's offering. And as we read the story, God says this to Cain. Why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching. This picture, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you. But you must, again, a command, you must rule over it. Cain murders Abel. He doesn't rule over it. And God comes to Cain and he says, Cain, where is your brother? God knew where his brother was, but he was trying to help Cain get something that Cain wasn't getting. Where is your brother? And Cain says, am I my brother's keeper? Oh my goodness. I cannot imagine saying that to God. Cannot. I mean, this guy, Cain, he must have been something. But he did. He said that to God. And it shows us 
We might not say that to God, but we have that attitude. We all do. We fall into it so easily. Not my problem. They made their bed, lie in it. No skin off my nose. We have that attitude. We so easily pick that up, but that is not my problem. But all throughout Scripture, we are called to have each other's back, to love each other, support each other. That list I gave you, full of all the things we're called to do to take care of our brothers and sisters. So we've got to watch out. We've got to be vigilant for that attitude, me over we. So I was thinking about this, and I was thinking about, you know, when I stand up here, you guys, I have not arrived. Like, I'm, I'm preaching to me, 100%. And I was thinking about this, the sin crouching at our door that we must rule over. And I got to tell you, in my life, I have to watch for it, because this is what happens. I'll be going along, and um, this happened to me about three months ago. I, I went out of my way to do a nice deed for somebody. And Like, I can be selfish, and so this was a big, like, step. I was, like, doing this really nice thing. I was being generous. I was going out of my way, and I show up, and and I do the nice thing, and the response I get is a really snarky comment. And I just walked away, like, (sighs) just frustrated, self-righteous, angsty. So you know what I did? I called my girlfriend. She does not live in this community. And I said, blah, 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 blah. And I uh, verbally processed um, slang for slandered and gossiped with my friend. I had to text her the next day and apologize and ask her for forgiveness. But we, we justify it. I justified it in that moment. Instead, I have to watch for it because it's not about me. It's not about how that person made me feel. It is about the world knowing God loves the world. And if I am divided with my sister in Christ, and then I'm telling other people I'm divided with my sister in Christ, I am not being obedient. And I'm kind of taking on the attitude, did God really say? So, that's my naughty. I'll leave you to figure out what you need to watch for in your life. Second thing that we need to do is we need to hit the pause button. So in that moment, when that snarky comment came my way, I should have, do you guys, anybody remember the tape players? Right, you could hit pause and the tape, the tape would quit, stop, slow down. That's what we should do, we should hit the pause button and then we should go to God. Father God, I come to you, man, I was trying to do something nice, and that person really hurt my feelings, just made me feel like I was a failure, la, la, la. God, please help me, change me, and help me to know, help me to know, listen to this, how to respond to that in a way that keeps the unity. God, please teach me. Holy Spirit, lead me. How do I keep the unity in this situation? That is the better way. So this point two is hit the pause button and protect the egg. Protect the egg. Do you guys know what that means? (laughs) Okay, this is a fun part. I'm excited about this. Okay, does anyone know, and I'm going to ask for real, does anyone know, maybe somebody in here does. If you did, I wish I had a million dollars. I don't. June 22nd, 1984. Anybody know? Okay, nobody knows. The first Karate Kid movie came out on the big screen. Ah, uh, yes, it was a memorable, memorable season in my life. So much, so much fun. Okay, so since then, Karate Kid has just been on a roll. It has not stopped. And it's still going. There's still the storyline continuing. It has different titles, and I don't really know where you find it, but it's still out there, and it, they're still making new episodes and series. And so, um, The other day, Steve and I were watching, and I want to paint a picture for you of this scene. I wish we could show it, but because we live stream, um, we can't show these things anymore, or they cut us off. So, some background. There's two competing dojos, and a dojo is like a gym, only where you learn martial arts, so you learn how to do martial arts, and then you practice the martial arts. And these two dojos, kind of from the beginning of time through the whole, all the years, um, they have two philosophies. The one philosophy is the way of the fist. Strike first, strike hard, no mercy, winning at any cost. 
And that's kind of the way the world is today. That's kind of that world out there that God loves. Kind of that philosophy. And then there's the other philosophy, and it is if the enemy insists on war, then you take away their ability to wage it. So in this episode, um, the Miyagi-Do, they're the kind of the good guys, okay? They're the, the ones with the take away the ability to wage war. And it's a group of high school kids, so these, these two dojos each have a high school team, like the Kodiaks and the Bulldogs, right? So it's, it's uh, Cobra Kai and Miyagi-Do. And Miyagi-Do is kind of the good guys. And Miyagi-Do is tired. I mean, every time they turn around, Cobra Kai is attacking. And then they're attacking. They go to the swimming pool, and Cobra Kai attacks. And then they go to school, and Cobra Kai attacks. And, and Miyagi-Do is just tired. And they're like, our philosophy is not a good one. We just keep getting hammered. You know, we just keep getting beat up. And so they're weary. They're turning on each other. You know when you get tired? Like if you're a husband and wife, and you get tired, and for no reason you start blaming your spouse for anything, they're that. They're just tired. They're over it. Some of them are wanting to quit. And Miyagi-Do has brought on this new coach, and his name is Chosen. And so Chosen calls all these high school kids together, and he tells them about a rare endangered bird. And then he gives each of them an egg. And these eggs are symbolic of this endangered rare bird. And he says to them, he says, your assignment is to protect the egg from the snake. Begin your preparation. And one of the students says, well, what are, what are we really protecting the egg from? And the coach looks at him and he goes, me! And he just runs after them and he just starts smashing their eggs and they're running and dispersing everywhere. And each one of those students thinks that their strategy is the winning strategy, that they're the one that knows how to protect their egg. Over the next five or six minutes, Coach Chosen smashes every one of their eggs, and then he brings them all back together. And this is what he says to them. He says, you are not good. Snakes will take you down one by one. I try to tell you, but you not listen. You must learn to adapt or you will become extinct. Try again. I mean, if you guys could see this team too, you've got every, you know, it's like the Bad News Bears kind of team. And they're all just like looking at, they're like video gamers and they're not like athletes and they're all just looking at each other and they're like, we just can't do this, like we don't know what to do. And then one of them says, wait, wait, I've got it. What if, in Christ Center I want us to hear this question, what if we weren't a bunch of ones? What if we work together? We need to be a team and everyone to play their special role. Only way we win is if we work together as one. So they all put their eggs in this basket together. And then they all circle up around the basket and then they wait and they anticipate, and they watch. And then you see Coach Chosen come charging out of the dark forest, and he's got this big wooden dowel. And I mean, I'm watching and thinking, if I'm a high school kid, I'm running. But they don't. They stand, and they have each other's back, and Coach Chosen comes, and he takes on the first kiddo, and that kiddo does their special karate stuff, and then the coach goes to the next one, and one by one. And if coach starts to break through, the rest of the kids come behind. And they protect the eggs. And the best part of this scene is at the very end, the coach is tired. He's an older guy, and he's tired. And he finally looks at him, and he goes, snake, concede. And in that moment, the kids recognize the power that they have in working together. And when you realize that you have a power, it, it's, it's amazing. And so working together, they found that power. This morning, the snake represents division for us. And the eggs, our mission, our mission to protect the endangered word, unity, all throughout our world right now, disunity, disunity, disunity. Here, have some disunity. Here, let's fight about this. Here, let's fight about that. Here, let's disagree about this and turn it into a fight. Hey, let's hate each other. 
It's everywhere. It's all over. And we have an opportunity as a church to protect the love of God that the world needs to see, and we do that by unifying. We must ask ourselves, am I doing my part in as much as it is possible with me, am I protecting unity in the body of Christ? If we are not doing that, if we are not unified, listen to this, if we are not unified, God's love is not evident. And I wanna end this morning with one more story. I wanna tell you about a BLT, a bear, a lion, and a tiger, and their inseparable bond. The BLT are the only bear, lion, and tiger in the world that live in the same enclosure. In 2001, Blue, an American black bear, Leo, an African lion, and Shere Khan, a Bengal tiger, were discovered in an Atlanta home's basement by police officers during a drug raid. At only a few months old, all three cubs were frightened, malnutritioned, infected with internal and external parasites. The Georgia Department of Natural Resources brought the cubs to Noah's Ark, a nonprofit animal sanctuary in Locust Grove, Georgia. <clears throat> when, the cubs, when the cubs arrived, sorry, I hate to do this, I gotta drink water. Uh -huh. When the cubs arrived to Noah's Ark, each had their own set of afflictions. Shere Khan the tiger was underweight and malnourished, <clears throat> and Leo the lion had an open infected wound on his nose from cruel confinement <clears throat> to a small crate. <clears throat> Sorry, you guys. Baloo, the American black bear, <coughs> was in the worst condition of the three cubs, rescued with a severely ingrown harness digging into his flesh because it was never loosened as he grew in size. The harness was so ingrown that his flesh had begun to grow over and around it, and surgical intervention was required to remove the harness and clean his deep infected wounds. During Baloo's surgery was the only time the three brothers have ever been separated from one another. The trio, affectionately known as the BLT, eat, sleep, play together. They even seek out grooming from one another and are often seen head rubbing and licking one another. Their terrifying early months in life has bonded the three and they are truly inseparable. Noah's Ark Animal Sanctuary is a nonprofit organization that is home to over 1,500 animals. Listen to that. 1,500 animals from 100 different species. And as a church, let us let that sink in. They all live together, 100 different species. They are devoted to rescuing and providing a permanent home for animals that have been abused, abandoned, neglected, as well as the animals who are surrendered for many different reasons. They also provide a forever home for animals who come from breeding facilities or have become surplus animals, unwanted. I was drawn to this story because it speaks of something so special. It's so unique. You don't ever hear this story. It speaks of unity amongst unlikely animals. In one of the stories I read about the BLT trio, one of the people that worked with them said this, they are totally oblivious to the fact that in any other circumstance, they would not be friends. Christ Center, let that be said of us so that the world